Hello folks, thanks for tuning in to a new Doctor's Orders episode. Right off the bat we see a lingering shot of a tombstone or few and a house. That is a one spooky house indeed. Yeah, let's marvel the spookiness of this house for a little while longer, let it really sink in. And not long after all this spookiness we get to see some bare skin. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that this is the aftermath of an act of fornication. The pretty girl is now going to look for her mating partner, seems that he bailed and that's a really douchebag move. Or could it be that he actually is now returning to the sea? Oh, well he did but in an expired form. Look out there's a kitchen knife behind you! And through your skull. It is one of the horror movies traits and rules that a couple must die after doing the hanky-panky, especially in an abandoned house. Our anonymous murderer drags the girl's lifeless body into the basement. Let the opening credits roll. What the fuck are we watching today? We are watching an Italian horror movie directed by the Grand Maestro Lucio Fulci. House by the Cemetery was made in 1981. Lucio Fulci, the director of the movie, is mostly known for his horror movies, but the man has done movies all over the spectrum. Giallos, westerns, comedies, you name it. And I need to be honest here, this is not really his best work, so you might be asking yourself why is the doctor recommending this movie? Well, even though it's a lower grade movie of his, it still has its moments. If you're into extreme close-ups of eyes, beautiful camera work and the occasional grotesque, gory scenes, you're in for a treat. As the camera pans to the right, we see that we are in New York and there's a very blonde boy looking at the picture of that house we've already been in. The first extreme close-up of eyes. The boy's mother arrives to the room and she has for some reason given the name Bob for the boy. Now don't take me wrong, there's nothing wrong with the name Bob, but somehow the name Bob and the boy does not go well together. The boy says that there was a girl in the house which the mother does not see and here is the girl itself. I'm already confused by this movie. It is a very well-known fact that these movies of the era were not really praised for their excellent writing. The girl's mother tells her to stop eyeballing at the house. Norman on the left is the father of Bob and he is uh, going to move into the house we've already seen. His colleague and his teacher Dr. Peterson had committed suicide and he had lived in that house before. Now before Dr. Peterson committed suicide he murdered his mistress and Norman here is determined to go and clear his colleague's and teacher's name. Now if you can't keep up with the names and who is who and what is what, don't worry about it, it's not the point. Let's just enjoy the visuals of this movie and how silly it is. Okay, now everything is packed and off they go to Boston. Alright, cut to a window shopping girl. She's already planning what she's gonna wear on her prom night when that day comes. Holy hell, what a creepy looking mannequin. Are you really sure, girl, you wanna buy anything from that store? Look at that. Holy... Yeah, take a minute and think hard where you wanna spend your... Uh, yeah, I think that pretty much does it. Yeah, shop somewhere else. Take your hard-earned allowances and spend them elsewhere. What kind of mannequin pleads when it's decapitated? Or maybe she just has a vivid imagination. Beats me. Norman, Lucy and Bob arrive to the real estate office to pick up Dr. Peterson's house keys. They are greeted by the realtor and then it seems like the house keys are not to be found and this of course annoys the realtor asking her employee where are the fucking keys. Here they are you little she devil right in front of you. The realtor accepts the insult and the keys reluctantly. While this little not so friendly banter is happening in the office, Bob hears someone talking to him. But who could that be? Who is that? It is that girl from the picture in the house and she wants to know his name, to which Bob complies. As Norman and Lucy come out from the office they realize that Bob is no longer in the car. Lucy quickly removes her sunglasses to get a better view, but no worries, Norman has already located their son because he has clearly the better eyesight. Hmm, Bob has obtained a creepy doll, most likely from the creepy girl. Norman and Lucy are obviously relieved and now they are ready to go finally to the house and here they are. The realtor says good luck with this money hole. Already unpacking and settling in, Norman and Lucy are a little bit worried about this creepy looking doll. Where did our Bob get this? Look at this, it's ugly as fuck. After a closer inspection, Norman is like, hey, it's just a doll, Lucy, come on, don't sweat about it. Lucy throws the doll on the floor. Norman tries to calm Lucy down, but she's not taking it. But Norman knows her soft spot and he commences abusing it. Haha, <laughs> works every time. Lucy continues unpacking and putting the things in order when she feels someone has arrived. 
and that is the nanny the realtor had promised to obtain for them. The nanny goes, are you Mrs. Boyle? Lucy picks up some very strange vibe. Look at those eyes. Oh, hey, wait a minute. Those, hey, it's like the mannequin alive. And another close up of eyes. The night has fallen. Lucy is catching some Z's. Meanwhile, Norman is checking into what the hell did Dr. Peterson study here and finds a bookcase titled Freudstein, which is empty and hears a sound. Could it have been Lucy? Farting in her sleep? Maybe. When suddenly, another noise. Hmm, better take off the glasses. Hmm, very interesting. The door is ajar, but Norman is pretty sure he closed it. He goes and takes a look outside. But he hears this sound, Lord, just like a child is crying. So decides to step into Bob's room. Bob is tucked in, but decides to tuck him in once more when all of a sudden, another sound. Now Norman is convinced those are no fart sounds and decides to go investigate further. Check the rest of the house. He might jump on in someone by surprise. Carefully opening the door. And who do we see here? And close up of the nanny's eyes. Close up of Norman's eyes. Yeah, rather show the pretty eyes. There we go. It's the battle of the eyeballs. And feels ashamed, caught red-handed, making all that racket. Next day, Norman goes to the library where Dr. Peterson was working. The librarian gives access to Norman to all the Dr. Peterson's documents and books that he was reading. And he's convinced that uh, Norman has been there before, but Norman says no fucking way. And here is the librarian's helper, who will be there at Norman's disposal for anything he might need. Then the librarian's colleague decides to throw in some trivia, a little fun fact about where Dr. Peterson hang himself while well, it's up there. In case you didn't know, neat, huh? Yeah, I was wondering where the hell is Bob? Well, Bob is outside playing with his toy car next to a tombstone from all places. Well, they are living next to a cemetery. Spending some quality time with this mysterious little girl. Meanwhile, Lucy, mom, is cleaning up the house, sweeping the floors, washing them properly, and finds something under the carpet. And what could that be? It's dusty as hell, that's for sure and there seems to be a cross and the name Freudstein on it. That looks eerily much like a tombstone. She then hears some noises coming from the kitchen and of course wants to go and have a closer look, but there is nothing there until she finds that the door of the basement is shaking on its own and this causes her to flip her wig. Once Norman arrives home, he hears his wife sobbing somewhere in the distance. He's thinking, oh my god, what has she done this time? Why can't I just have one peaceful moment and work on my things? I swear to god, one of these days, I think I'm gonna just pack up my bags and leave. That's what that face is saying. The next morning, Lucy wakes up and is still a little bit shaken, but Norman is over there so she can feel secure. Norman gives a nice big warm hug and thanks the pills over there for giving him a moment of peace and silence finally. Lucy convinces Norman to go and check what the hell is happening in the basement. However, they are interrupted by Bob and the nanny who come from outside. Bob informs his parents that he met this nice little girl again who gave the doll. Lucy does not dig that one bit and Norman is looking for the right keys and fights them and now uh, 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 I don't know what to make out of that just a random staring contest I guess Norman is now making his way into the basement oh yes a flashlight good call as they are slowly eyeing the basement from above Norman makes his move down the stairs better be careful aha he finds something that which looks like a ring okay no one will notice if I nick this yeah, it might be worth something. Okay, Norman gets up and starts checking what other treasures he might find when... Ah! Something came out from the walls! Lucy rushes down the stairs only to be attacked by that same fucking thing which is a bat. I hope Lucy has her rabies shots in order. She is frantically trying to shake off that bat. Oh man, here we go again, Norman thinks to himself. And finally rushes in to help, removes the bat from the hair. But that pesky bat attacks his hand. Yeah. Norman rushes to the kitchen, grabs a pair of scissors and stucks that pest of a bat. Ah, that should do it. Oh, whoa, no, it didn't. Norman is trying to swing that fucking bat off of his hand and gets no help. Whoa, Bob will be scarred for life, that's a fact. That bat is hanging on to its dear life. Yeah, a couple of more stabs at it. That should come off any second now. Fucking hell, that's gross. Ah. Finally, out quicker than the Toronto Maple Leafs had a playoffs, the frightened couple is back at the realtor demanding that they can undo their rental agreement, whereas the realtor says, yeah, yeah, go ahead, I'll call the boss. Hey, now that yuppie couple wants to leave the Freudstein mansion. Are you fucking kidding me? 
cut to the mysterious creepy girl who is staring into our souls. Ah, she warns the realtor not to go into the house, which of course she does. She wants to know what is the big fuss about this, about attacking bats and basement doors rumbling on their own. When she sees something and wants to go and have a look, see? On her way there she trips on the fraudstein tombstone and hurts her ankle pretty bad when someone with a really serious skin problem takes a fireplace poker, makes its way towards the realtor and stabs her in the gut. One stab is naturally not enough in this type of horror movie, so we gotta have one more or maybe two more pokes at her. Yeah, mm, uh, I, I, I can't think of anything to poke fun at. <coughs> No, but seriously, that was a pretty cool death scene, if you ask me. Once again, the murderer cleans after himself. That's pretty thoughtful. Ah, obviously not everything. I take that back. Who, who is the poor person who has to clean that? Oh, and the nanny. Lucy is not too happy about the mess, but at least she's grateful for Anne cleaning up the mess. So grateful that she offers her a coffee, but... Uh, ah, another close-up of eyes, everyone. Ah, am I ring that well? Is she trying to be seductive? Norman goes back to the library, he needs to look more into what Dr. Peterson was researching. The other librarian is surprised to see Norman there. Surprised? That's what I just said. The librarian is like, oh, but it's Sunday. Yeah, I know what day of the week it is. Yes, it is Sunday. Yes, it is Sunday. Okay, it is Sunday, so I'll let you be. After that odd conversation, Norman takes a good look at the place where Dr. Peterson hanged himself. Norman finds a cassette of Dr. Peterson's. Let's hear it out. It might explain why he committed suicide. My God. Of course, this explains everything. Norman, you know what to do with that tape. It might be the master tape. You have the chance to put an end to all this. No one is watching, just go for it. Go, for crying out loud, hurry it up. Do it, do it, burn that fucker. Good man, wait a minute, you're already leaving? Huh, that library must hold several of those master tapes. Go back and burn the whole fucking building down, please. You would do a service to this world. And here we have again the mysterious creepy girl. I think there's more to her than meets the eye. And speaking of eyes, let's get ready to an extreme close-up of eyes. There we go. I've lost count how many of these we've had so far. Meanwhile, Lucy is picking up some groceries when Norman just leaves her there, forgets to take her with him and drives off. Lucy is like, oh well, I better walk home and almost get run over by a car. Back in the house, Bob continues playing. When he loses his toy car, oh, must have gone to the basement. Well, he just has to go in there. And calls out for Bob and has a very quick look around the house, but he is nowhere to be seen. Ah, he must have gone down to the basement. Let's go and have a look. Now, certainly something evil lurks there, just waiting for Anne. And uh, oh, the door gets closed behind her. Ah, she's locked inside. What is he gonna do now? Oopa, that does not beat well. One last close up of Anne's eyes as she's going to be sliced and diced. Let's have a moment here and uh, remember Anne, the nanny. Holy fuck, Knuckles. I mean, she was odd and everything, but I don't know if she deserved to be killed in this way. Ah, nasty. But a very cool practical effect. Bob is now in the kitchen and the basement door opens slowly behind him, which like invites Bob to go down, but something else is coming from the top of the stairs. What is it? Poor Anne, she's been decapitated just like the mannequin. Yeah, Bob, it's time to cut and run. Yeah, go for it. Oh, your hand got stuck. Must be some kind of supernatural force pressing that door on your arm. And oh, you barely made it, Bob. And as mommy arrives home, she is of course totally oblivious to the horrors waiting there. Checks quickly on Bob, who is there in his room, crying his eyes out. Bob fills mom in with the horrible details. Of course, Lucy refuses to believe, so she must go and see it for herself. Yeah, just as she expected, nothing here. Disappointed with Bob, she just shakes her head. Oh, what a bullshitter you are. But oh, Lucy, you couldn't be more wrong. There are two evil eyes looking at you. Norman finds himself in another cemetery. He is looking for the Dr. Freudstein's grave. The caretaker informs Norman, hey, it's Sunday. Norman says, yeah, I know, I've already had this stupid conversation earlier today. 
takes off his glasses. The caretaker continues by saying that there is no Dr. Freudstein's tomb over here, but these records say he is here. Look, buddy, you just gotta go. It's Sunday. I already told you. Yeah, I know it's fucking Sunday. Lucy has prepared a glass of milk for Bob, but I don't think there's any milk that would make any child sleep after this kind of evening. Bob agrees. So what can he do? Oh, oh man. You have to admire this boy, he has testicles the size of demolition ball. Bob has clearly made his mind up and wants to go head on with uh, whatever that thing is there lurking. Oh, there they are. Those two evil eyes. Uh, could they be Dr. Freudstein's? Ah, we would just have to wait and see it at the end of the movie. Those eyes are all over the place. Well, well, it seems that Bob's testicles weren't that big after all. As he makes a run for it, Lucy hears him banging on the door. She's like, how the hell can I open this door? Oh yeah, with keys. But just like the first time when they entered the cellar, they needed some knives to help with the key turning. Gently now. Oh, a little too much strength there, Lucy. I think it's like in times like crisis, this human get this superhuman powers and therefore she broke the knife and the key. And is there yet another danger lurking behind her? Oh, no, it was Norman. Good old Norman comes to the rescue. He picks up an axe, tells Bob to stay away from the door, but this suddenly appearing hand has something else on mind. I don't know if I can watch this. Phew, that was a close one. Oh, and another one. Oh, man. Norman, please. Ah, oh, yeah, you got it. But this thing has another hand. Bob screams. Lucy screams. The mysterious ghoul has a break now. After all, his arm is cut off and trying to get on his feet. Very wobbly indeed. Bob plays dead. Pretty smart move. Holy shit, that is one ugly mother. Oh, yeah, she's in this picture. I already forgot. Goodness gracious me. Bob is surrounded. Norman has still not got through that door. Bob makes a pretty shocking discovery finding all the rotten corpses of the people who've killed so far by this ghoul. Yeah, there's decapitated nanny over there. As the clumsy ghoul is approaching slowly, Bob, we get to see a couple of more shots from the deceased bodies. In case you're wondering, this is Dr. Freudstein and he's been living there in the cellar using these people's bodies, somehow regenerating his cells. Bob finds himself again in hot water, but Norman comes for the rescue. At least he thought he would rescue, but the ghoul gets the better of him and throws him away. The ghoul looks very drowsy. Must have used all his energy in this scuffle. Yeah, take a break. Norman has an aha moment. Grabs the nearest knife and pokes at Dr. Freudstein's rotting corpse where some kind of maggot bolognese comes out. Why are you standing there? Stab him another time. Oh, that's fucking stomach turning. Norman can't believe his own eyes. The ghoul is about to give a bitch slap but goes for the throat instead. Lucy and Bob have no options but to witness this horrible death their loving husband and father is gonna go through. Pretty gruesome practical effect indeed. Lucy needs to get up on her feet because the ghoul is already eyeing on them. But where to go, where to run? There it is their way out. Lucy and Bob get on their feet and make a run for it to the stairs. I want, ah, okay, it's under the tombstone of Dr. Freudstein. It is the very same hole where the realtor got her foot stuck. The drowsy ghoul is slowly but steadily making his way towards Lucy. Does he have a foot fetish? I don't know. Ghoul Dr. Freudstein raises his ugly head. Lucy knows they both are living on borrowed time. When the ghoul strikes at Lucy, taking her down the stairs, hitting her jaw on every step. This is actually a pretty hilarious scene. Actually, I find it a pretty inventive way to film this scene, cutting back from uh, Lucy's POV to this zooming in and out medium shot of her. <laughs> And that's the end of Lucy. Bob is the last human standing, desperately trying to squeeze his way through this hole that oddly enough reminds me of a vulva. Anyone else pick up that symbolism? And Dr. Fordstein has a hold on Bob, but so does someone else above and yanks Bob out from that floor vagina. Now who on earth could have come in the nick of time and rescue? Oh, it's that girl again. But the movie is yet to play its trump card. Here we go. Time to go home and remember your manners. Now that Bob is staying, show him you can act like a Freudstein. You know some other guest is surely destined to drop in. What the actual fuck? So this lady here is the Mary Freudstein, mother of this girl. Both of them are spirits and now have adopted Bob into their Freudstein family. And there we have it, that was House by the Cemetery. I've seen this movie many times and still have plenty of question marks. Anyway, thanks for watching, have a nice evening, bye.